Welcome to Learning with Lowell. I'm your host, Lowell Thompson. We cover biotech and science-related topics on the show, such as startups working on antibiotic drugs or colon cancer, to venture capitalists talking about funding and how that worked, to people talking about how they and you could found a science-backed startup. Two, and this is one of my favorite parts, people talking about the science, specific science-related topics such as whales or protein engineering. You're really going to get a lot, and it's all going to be about science on this podcast. There are two main episode types. One, the case study where one or a group of people talk about what they did, and you can kind of get a sense of how you could do it as well. To the second type, which is a group talking around a theme such as citric greening, which is coming up soon, or neurodegenerative disorders, which I'm also working on. Please sign up for our newsletter to get a other resources and outside podcast content from guests of my own research, which comes out every Monday. Join us every Tuesday for new podcast releases and check out the website every Thursday for something new. You can find us at, at Lowell here on Twitter, Facebook, and my website, learningwithlowell.com. And don't forget to subscribe, tell your friends, and leave a review. It takes really only 10 seconds for you to do any of those things, which helps me and my guests create great content because it gives us feedback. Let's other people know about it, and the more people know about science and support it, the better everything is. Today we are joined with Heidi Steltzer, a PhD in environmental science explorer and science communicator. She has been in Reddit AMAs, been featured in and published in Nature, New York Times, multiple medias, works at Fort Lewis Collins in Colorado, and in this podcast we get into how she finds herself in nature how you can find your path through science how the world kind of boxes you a little bit but that if you work in a specific way you can find where you belong you know like where you were meant to go a bit how to communicate science effectively with people how to cons uh better conservation practices i mean we really get into a lot this is a, a little sample but there's a lot of content here look for the hyperlink show notes in the description Follow us on Twitter, follow us on Facebook, tell your friends, and leave a review because that's very helpful. Please and thank you. When was the last time you were surprised? As a scientist, I always think it's it's fun to hear when like a scientist is doing something and they get like an unexpected thing come from it. So like, what was the last time something surprised you? Oh goodness, that's such a fantastic question. It happens all the time in science. So I don't know that I pay attention to each and every one. One of the things that I've been thinking about a lot this winter, it hasn't snowed much and it's been really warm in Colorado and unusually warm so that having less water is kind of a big deal if you're a plant because it's warm enough that if you're green, you might be able to grow and photosynthesize, but it's, there was no water. Like it just, it wasn't raining. It wasn't snowing. I had students, I'm a professor at Fort Lewis College and I had students in my ecology class measuring how much water is in the soil. And it was so little, it was like 2%, 4% soil water content. And it was so little that it's pretty much non-existent. The plants can't access that. And there was a news story this winter about junipers not doing well in our region because of the warm, dry winter. And I just assumed it was going to be the Utah junipers. So we have two main species of juniper around here. One is Utah juniper. And it's the gorgeous tree that's part of all those desert southwest pictures that you see of New Mexico and Arizona. It's mixed in with pinyon pine. And back in the early 2000s, the pinyon pine didn't do very well because of a warm, dry summer. And so when it was a warm, dry winter, I thought it's the species it co-lives with that didn't do well in the in, in the unusual winter. People started throwing out the term winter drought this winter, and I had never really heard that phrase or thought about it because not having water in winter is a different thing for plants than not having it in summer. And, uh, and so I had students who were interested in starting to understand some of how the junipers weren't doing well. And a pair of students came back from their, their explore across campus. The campus at Fort Lewis College has a lot of natural ecosystems on it. So students can do projects right on our campus. And they came back and they're like, yeah, we're going to study the Rocky Mountain juniper. And I looked at them, but I didn't correct them because I thought they get to pick what species they want to study just because I think they should study Utah juniper. doesn't mean that they should study the species I would have picked. It's their choice. So they came back and they're like, we're going to study Rocky Mountain juniper. And we picked our two sites and we've got our 
first soil water content data and they don't look that healthy. And and again, I, I like to really see what the students decide to do. And, and I would have picked Utah, but they picked Rocky Mountain. And they had a great reason for why they picked Rocky Mountain Juniper. They said, we picked it because it's at its, its lower elevation limit here in Durango. So generally, you would find more Rocky Mountain Juniper as you go up into the mountains from here. And so they thought that a plant that generally prefers a colder place would get more stressed in a warm winter, which is great. Great logic. I had a different reason that I thought it was Utah Juniper. That's science. Science is having two different ideas and seeing what you learn. So they started their study and and I started exploring the junipers on my own. I trail run. And so I was going on some trail runs in an area called Horse Gulch, which is this natural area right near our, our campus in our town. And back up in Horse Gulch, I was like, oh my God, it's totally the Rocky Mountain Juniper that aren't doing well. And I loved that my students had had the correct framing and thinking. And sometimes I think that the more we read and the more we understand from past research, the more we're not open to all of the possibilities that might happen because we come in with some bias because we've heard of stories of a tree that hasn't done well. And it's like, oh, of course it would be that tree again, when it's actually the other tree that for any studies I've ever read has always done fine. So that was kind of a surprising, a surprising piece. And then the other piece of that story is that when you grabbed onto the plant, in early February, and it had been really warm and dry, it didn't crumble into my hand. And if the tree was dead, it would have felt like it would just fall apart. And instead, it was like, there's still something here. This tree could come back. Then I thought of Monty Python, and um, I'm not dead yet. And so we've been joking about that all semester in my class, that the, the junipers are like shouting out that phrase. And indeed, they have pictures now. So they did a semester-long set of observations. And the pictures they literally just showed me yesterday in class show regreening of these junipers that were anything but green in the middle of winter. They were kind of this mottled gray rust color that just, I don't know, I mean, looked a little bit like vomit or <laughs> <laughs> something that doesn't look appealing or healthy. And yeah, they're brightening up, they're greening up. And so now all three of us, these two students and I are kind of like, huh, what and how like can a tree do that? How can it look so unhealthy and then have the resilience to tolerate poor conditions and bounce back. That's pretty cool. And that's what we want to, we want to start studying more. That's like a science question. How do you measure the water content of the soil? Do you take a sample, try and aerate it out or something? How would you do that? So that is one of the ways to do it. You can take a sample from the soil, bring it into the lab, make sure that you can small part that's very evenly mixed with the whole sample that you pull in and you weigh it before you put it in a drying oven and then you put it in a drying oven and you evaporate all the water off and you weigh it again. And so you find out how much water is in it as a proportion of how much it the water weighs versus the, the dry soil. But back when I was in grad school, people started doing a much more simple technique based on physics. And so you can buy an instrument and two metal prongs, you poke them into the ground. Mm -hmm. One prong sends an electric signal that is received by the other prong. And the time that it takes for the signal to go from one prong to the other is a function of how much water is in the space within the soil. The, there's soil provided it's not compacted and all pushed down and, and, and squashed, has a lot of airspace in it. And so the water in soil is filling in or not filling in that airspace. And, and it's measurement technique that we can use so that without having to collect soil and bring it in the lab and do a bunch of work, you can just take direct measurements in the field. It's not as precise, but sometimes you just want to get a lot of data and you don't care if it's not as precise. That's interesting. Is, is the, does that have like a catchy like name? Does that have like a cool acronym? <laughs> so it's called time domain reflectometry. And I have said that word at least six times this week because the students had to submit their posters and they were all like, what have we been doing all summer, all semester? And the best thing, I love like how words are used across generations. The instruments that the students have been using this semester, they're like, you know, that thingamajig, that jingamabob, that whatchamacallit and I like literally this week because there's it's not the only instrument that has a big name that we've been using this semester and I heard like every phrase from my youth and I was so jazzed to know that you know at 46 there's still 20 year olds that are using the exact same phrases to refer to something when you don't know what to call it <laughs> I just said they couldn't put it in the lab report it was fine to be in the talk but in the lab report it actually had to say time domain reflectometry <laughs> well it does have a catchy name the thingamajig <laughs> the, the thing we jig on the left. What's the thing that you're most passionate about, and what 
what was like, when did you know that you were passionate about it? The question that people have been asking me more lately is what it, what is my purpose and how do we understand what our purpose is? And that's a little different than passion, although they're, they're often connected together. Purpose is, is so important to developing a strategy and choices so that we feel like we're moving towards something that we they were excited about each and every day that that when there's more to do than you can do, your purpose helps you select among the things because you can look to your purpose and say, this choice, this act- activity would be a lot of fun, but it's not consistent with my purpose. And these other activities might be a lot of work and hard and I might not be able to to achieve some of them. But even if I don't achieve them, it moves me more close to my purpose. And My purpose is interwoven with science and people. It's really both of those two things together, that I care about people and I care about the planet. And I think that science can help inform our understanding for how the planet can can care for us, that we can care for the planet and the planet can care for us by providing the things that, that human health and human well-being depend on. And so I value conversations with people that helped me to understand that purpose better. I value traveling places where there are no people. And that's what I've done a lot of in my career. It's absolutely, I had literally never camped before I went to college. And then I decided that to be a biologist, I needed to learn how to camp. You don't need to know how to camp to be a biologist. Most biologists don't camp. But I got in my head as a freshman in college that I would need to know how to camp. And I signed up for an experiential education program and spent my spring break of my freshman year backpacking in the mountains of North Carolina, really cold with a group of 10 people I didn't know because that's how the experiential education programs work. And then you get to know each other. And it's definitely led to lifelong love of being in really remote places and moving into spaces where I'm by myself in landscapes that many people would perceive as dangerous. I feel like the statistics are that you're so much more likely to get hurt in a car accident. And since I'm nowhere near cars, <laughs> I figure I'm pretty safe near the grizzly bears, the polar bears, the ice flows, the whatever it ends up being, the lightning storms, the I think one of the one of the near misses I had was this river in Alaska that I needed to cross kind of like into the wild in John Krakauer's book. And I needed to cross the river to get to the other side. And I misestimated how fast the river was flowing. And I almost slipped. And I had a backpack on and you don't need to be in a lot of water that's flowing with a backpack on to not be able to get back up. If it's flowing over your head, the pressure and the force is enough to usually to sometimes keep you under. But I made it to the other side and I didn't end up slipping. And I decided I would never make the same choice again to rush across the stream. I learned how to better cross streams. Especially since you can drown in like two inches of water. That that stuff is it's really deceptive. It's like, oh, this looks really beautiful, <laughs> but yep. it'll kill you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so there's this book, this Italian book. And for people who are listening, I reference this book quite often because I'm weird. There, that basically says that like everyone who sees you sees a different version of you and that that version of you is what they play for essentially and then that influences how you make your decisions so do you ever feel when you get away from people that you start becoming more of who you feel you are versus how other people feel you are and then does that at all impact who you become when you return yes that is a great a great thought a great reflection i like the time by myself in remote places to become more self-aware and reflect on choices and make the choices that are consistent with who I want to be. I want to be courageous and and being courageous means that you're always afraid because if you're not afraid, you don't need to be courageous. And so I found that it was much easier to put myself into remote wildland places and be courageous than it was to put myself in spaces where there's dynamic and antagonistic conversation where it's more likely that emotionally you could be hurt. It's easier to be in a space that you might physically be hurt, but you're emotionally safe, if that makes sense. And so for me, it's been really only the past year. So I'm 46. So really only during my 45th year, it's a wonderful middle midlife time to reflect Mm -hmm. that I started realizing how much being in Learning how to be courageous in wild places now helps me be courageous in the places I couldn't have been courageous when I was 20. And I think for some people, it's different. 
and they may have always felt comfortable being in those social settings and know how to deal with somebody who's angry with them and manage for that and 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 not get pulled in and not be upset by the person who's upset and and for me that's much more where what I'm learning how to do now and it's the it's the time in the wild that has given me time to reflect and time to grow and time to learn that I'm more courageous than I ever realized I was just was defining one set of challenges and now there's another whole set I think that's like a, I think that's a really beautiful idea that like breaking out of the mold I think people tend to build a box, you know, like, oh, this is who I am. This is what I do. And so going into a place that doesn't have that defined box, you get to even unintentionally grow into something new. And then when you go back, you can't, you can't ever go back into the box, which is, you can't go back in the box, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> which is good. Cause that'd probably hurt. Especially. Correct. <laughs> correct. And the more, the more time, I mean, science and being a scientist felt like a really safe space for a long time. And that doesn't mean that it was a safe space, but it felt safe. I got funded straight out of undergrad by two fellowships that provided for five years of education for my PhD. That's that's incredible stability for somebody who is 21, 22 years old to know you have a job for five years and and funding to, to stay in school. It felt like a really safe place in those kind of ways. And and yet science has its challenges. We're all people just like people outside who don't spend time in science. And lately it's felt like some of the spaces outside the science community are safer spaces. And and it's a fun dynamic to learn that, to experiment with it and and find new ways to share science. That's you know, another one of my passions as I'm as I talk about my purpose is to care for people on planet, then one of my passions is sharing science because we need to have an opportunity to have the discussions about what is science, what do you learn from science? Is it what you thought it is? Do you really hate it because of an experience you had at some point during your school system or a way by telling someone a story that I can help help science feel a little bit less foreign, whatever happened as a result of the school. I think that's a uh, like a really noble thing because science is, I think, innate in us. That curiosity, that hunger to learn, if that's somehow been smothered, like I, then, you know, reawakening that, you know, with a spark of a story or something like that, I think that it's probably got to be really rewarding. Has it, has there been, has there been like a story that seems to work or, or like a thing that seems to be effective? Like maybe there are people who are listening and are like, hey, I want to, I want to love science again. <laughs> there isn't one story. I've been doing this for 25 years, so I've got hundreds of stories. So tell me something that you care about, Lol, in the natural world, and then we'll come up with a story. Things I care about. I like whales. I like cephalopods. I like growing things. I like being in an area with lots of trees. And you, you know, like in the morning where like there's dew and then like the little moss and the lichens and stuff like have like that, like that, uh, that vibrant green, like they're engorged with the water just so much like they're happy. Yeah. I like that. Like that's a, maybe like the, a weird way to describe how, <laughs> how a, a, a moss can look happy based on how much water it's had. But I love that type of stuff. I, I like the idea of planting things and then nurturing it over a long period of time and then coming back and seeing how it's changed and yet stayed the same a little bit at the same time. Yeah, that, I don't know, that's shotgunning it. I also like the human brain. <laughs> I'll stick with those other examples because <laughs> the human brain is something I, I absolutely haven't studied and I don't completely get. <laughs> I, I trust that other people are doing good science about the brain. But yeah, lichen and that lichen can be so much different than I ever thought they would be. So I actually have a coffee table book that lichens of Alaska, and it's just this massive, thick book, and you can flip through pages, and it's only one state, and and there's so many lichens in Alaska. And they're not just what you think about for lichens. They're not just small and adhering to rocks and in little patches, some green ones, some yellow ones, some orange ones, they can also be bigger than the plants. So I've been to places in Alaska, as well as in Southern Greenland, where there are so many lichens, they're more abundant than the plants, they're bigger than the plants, and they're really varied. And they form structures that almost look a bleached coral reef, because they're they're not as big as a coral reef. But if, if you lie down in the tundra, which I love to do, and you put your face really close, then it's almost like you're snorkeling, but you're in the tundra of Alaska instead. And you're watching little insects climb around on all the different lichens. And then I like to go during berry season. So you're also like hunting for the plants that have really little leaves, but giant berries and what you can eat for berries. But one of the things that, that lichen do 
tied to what you just described. They change the feel of the tundra when you walk on it, whether they do or don't have all that water in them. And for most of the time that I've been doing research in Alaska and Greenland, when you walk on the tundra, it squishes. And so each step, you can watch your foot depress into this like mossy lichen-y patch, and then it pops right back up again when the moss and the lichen are are plumped out with the water the way you described. It makes for slower travel because each step is you never know how much you're going to sink, but it feels soft. And then when you lie down, you get a little bit wet and your clothes get damp, but you just, you feel like you're on an air mattress or on a waterbed because it's just so soft. And lately when I've gone to Alaska, the last time I went to Alaska was last summer and the time the year before I went to Greenland in the summer, the lichens and the mosses didn't squish, they crunched. And that's a like an alarming kind of disturbing feeling when someplace that you're used to squishing crunches. And with each step, multiple ideas go through my head. And that's, that's the beauty of, of what you do learn and grow by doing the exploration and the science is that there's all these ideas that get triggered. And I'm like, Oh my God, I'm killing this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so when it squishes, you know that it's just going to pop right back up, but it just felt wrong to even be walking across land where with each step, your foot crunches on the ground and the lichen's breaking into pieces and it'll still stay alive. So you, you're not really killing it, but you're changing the physical structure of it in a way that it won't provide the habitat that it's been providing as well. And it takes hundreds of years for some of those lichen to get big. So it didn't feel right to do that. And then the other thing that you know when you're walking across ground that squished and now it's crunching is that it could burn. In tundra, fires used to be very rare in tundra ecosystems and increasingly they're becoming more and more common. And it's not an ecosystem that likely has the potential to recover quickly from fire because the plants grow so slow. There's many other reasons why fire in the tundra would be concerning, but the landscape that I went to in 2016 in Greenland, it's near Kangarooloosawak, Greenland. It was very crunchy in 2016 and I didn't go there in 2017, but it was in the news that there was a massive tundra fire in that same area, an area that is World Heritage calving ground for caribou and right near the Greenland ice sheet. And it's concerning to hear that some someplace that special, someplace that important for, for the people of the region, for the caribou, but also for the planet. There's ways that fire becomes more common. There are impacts on the atmosphere and on ice. So it's not just the landscape where the fire happened that gets affected when there are fires. Are there things we can do I mean, I think a lot of people might be more familiar with the Montreal Protocol that banned certain aerosols that were depleted in the ozone layer. And after, I think, like 30 years, we've had some data come out that shows that like the, those holes are, are shrinking because of that, that work. Is there anything nowadays that we're doing that is that you think is going to be that type of impactful if we all pull together and, and do something? like Basically, are the things that people who are listening can do to, to positively impact climate change so that the Earth is more supportive of humans? That's a long question. Yes. The answer, the easy answer is yes. There's much we can do. There are people who've done analyses of where and how educating women and girls and family planning would have a huge impact on managing for climate change, on refrigerants having an impact on climate change, on developing opportunities for for more and cheaper renewables. I'll put a plug in there. We shouldn't be, we shouldn't have a solar power tariff in the US. We should be encouraging and seeing solar grow and flourish in the US. Solar is the solution. We need to take our energy from the sun the same way that plants do. And I think there's any number of different ways that's been presented really well. But one of the things that I think, two things that I think would make a big difference that I've seen written about less often is that I like to think about why is it? Why is it that we're making choices that are destructive for our planet, destructive for other species, and ultimately could hurt and impact ourselves? And I think it's because we are hurting that as we've created opportunities for wealth, for prosperity, we've grown less connected to each other and less connected to the earth. The simple recognition, reflection on that? And can we do an act of kindness each day towards someone else, towards a plant in our yard that helps us bring and strengthen those connections again? That we can say we should put solar panels on our roofs, but that's not necessarily practical for everyone to do. They're ex they can still be expensive, or maybe you don't own your own home and you can't plan for your own energy system. Just starting to be kinder to people and, and think about that in a way that helps you connect to them and help helps you connect to other choices you want to make about the planet, I think is important. And then the second piece that I've been talking about more 
especially with outdoor. I think everyone loves something about being outside. For me, I like to be in really remote places, not on the peaks of mountains. I like to I like to trail around and I like to run to the saddles, to the mountain passes for a whole bunch of different reasons. It's better on my knees, go the steep rocky trails. I feel like I can move across the land more quickly if I'm not on the on the steeper peaks. So I like to move to the passes and and get a big view. But for other people it may be just as you described, the time in their yard caring for a plant an opportunity to sit by a stream and hear the water move. Watching children as they they run around in spring, having been cooped up a little bit in there may be any number of ways we connect to the outdoors. We need to allow ourselves to make that connection, prioritize it and make time for it. And then we need to tell people. We need to tell people what we did, why it was awesome, how it made us feel, and and foster those conversations about what's amazing about our world. And not have all of us want to do the same thing in our natural world, but see that there's a shared value for nature, even in people who spend very little time outside. And maybe they just go outside to have a cigarette, but the cigarette is all the better because they're outside having it. With that in mind, we would want to take care of the water, the air, the soil, the plants, the planet. We're amongst the generations that if we don't do something, we will know it. <laughs> like, we're the ones who are going to, like, you can't pass the buck anymore. Solutions we would want to do anyway. Wouldn't we want to be kind to one another anyway? And if it also helps to manage for something catastrophic, concerning, impact the health and well-being of other people, then it's like a win-win to manage for something that could otherwise be harmful. And I think a part, a piece of that that's really important, and I think millennials, Gen Z, those are the students that I teach in my classes. They are on fire. They are doing good things in our country and around the world. And yeah, it's because they're worried about the experiences they're living with each day in their schools. They're worried about what the future will be like for work and employment for themselves. Plus, you know, where and how well will the water and the and the air be for providing for them? And we need to support them, encourage them and create the opportunities. It, and it's not that hard. I mean, these are things they want to do. They're passionate. They're ready to jump on it. So where and how can we create the space that they want to be in anyway? It really, it's, it's an easy thing for many of us to do. Yeah, and I, I was thinking of things that people can do instead of having solar on your roof if you don't have an if you don't have your own home and stuff like that. You could have a little lichen garden. You could grow a little lichen garden. I have a I have a moss garden, but like you could have <laughs> like bring it inside and then have that. Then your air will it'll be better. Like I have flowers inside and it smells lovely. I've been laughing because you keep saying how much you care for and create spaces and homes for plants. There isn't a single plant in my house. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I study plants and I'm busy enough with all the work that I do that plants in my home die. And I decided it wasn't a good idea to keep purchasing. I, my last one was this fall, just before Thanksgiving. I really wanted some rosemary. And I thought, won't it be great to have rosemary all winter long, this plant inside, sprinkle it in olive oil and dip the bread in it. The rosemary plant lasted till January. So <laughs> November, December, January, and then I got too busy. Couldn't keep up with the watering of a single plant in my kitchen. And I'm in my kitchen every day. So yeah, no plants. <laughs> uh, well, you can you can actually set up systems to somewhat automate the process. You get the like the little bulbs that stick in the water. Or, oh. uh, or you can just have like a basin full of water with tubes attached into it. And then the plants will pull as needed. And I get a sage plant and I put it in my house. I'll try that. The, Things that taste good that we have, maybe not everything, but a lot of things tend to be things that are good for us. So one of the the challenges in the region I live in, and I live in the Western mountains of Colorado, we get big dust events this time of year. So we just had one earlier this week. We had another one last week. And it's the desert dust from the Colorado plateau that gets swept up into these big dust storms. You can't see you can feel it in your nose. You can taste it. For some of us, it it produces really bad allergies. And it wasn't the first couple of years. I've been living in Durango since 2009. And it wasn't the first couple of years. But by the third year I was living here, I started getting really bad allergies to the dust. Something like that can motivate one to... It also melts our snow. When the snowpack's really dusty, that's one of the things I study is where and what are the consequences of early snow melt due to the desert dust. But the more immediate consequence for me is that I, I get just totally congested and miserable from allergies. And I end up craving turmeric in April. It ends up being the month when I eat a lot of Indian food. And I started doing that 
And then two years into it, found out that turmeric has anti-inflammatory properties Mm -hmm. and is really good when you have allergies. And I was like, oh my God, I had no idea, but my body was like, eat Indian, eat Indian. (laughs) (laughs) Cause you did a a, a fantastic, you and several other people did a fantastic Reddit AMA. And there was a, a, there was a section where someone asked about the Ross Sea and you mentioned that it was becoming one of the largest merit marine protection areas and I, I just wanted to ask about that because what is the significance of that being the largest one and like why was it why did it become the largest one maybe i should have just googled this but like <laughs> <laughs> it was a part of your second so like oh man i can ask someone who would know so do you know so, yes yeah, so i went to antarctica in december of 2016 as part of a, co- a program called homeward bound and it's a program jumped up literally jumped up by a woman in australia named fabian datner who wanted to create an opportunity for the voice of science and the voice of women to be heard more in the world. So I was with 76 women on a ship, all of us scientists, coaches, and and other people helping us go through this leadership training experience. And we launched right after that Ross Sea protected area was established. Can't remember how a marine protected area like that happens, but because it's in Antarctica, it takes multiple countries and governments to agree on protecting it. And the last signatory was Russia, and Russia had just signed on board. The person, one of the people very active in that campaign, his name is Louis Pugh, he's been swimming in Antarctic waters to raise awareness for protecting marine life in these regions. And it seems like it's so far away from us that it wouldn't be connected to us or that it would be a place that we're concerned with. They're unique areas. They're full of really diverse life. The species that grow and live there don't just stay there. Many of them migrate. And and some of the species like whales that we might want to see in other parts of the world depend on the health and the Roth Sea to be able to survive. Is it significant that it's the biggest? Maybe. Is it easier to have a really big marine protected area really far from urban areas and transportation corridors and where people are fishing? Absolutely. I think what's more important is just to recognize that The ocean is so special to so many of us. It's a place that I think a lot of us can find inspiration. I love sitting next to the ocean shoreline and just listening to waves and that first jump in the ocean each season, always daring yourself to get really, really cold, Mm -hmm. um, but uh, regenerating in an amazing way. And for all the things that the ocean does for us, those more spiritual experiences, as well as providing us with a healthy atmosphere and food, we don't protect it the way that we protect areas on land because we can't see it and touch it and feel it in the same way. Mm -hmm. And so green protected areas are the equivalent of national parks and wildlands protection that happen on land. There's still not much of the ocean protected. And so the awareness built about the Ross Sea is fantastic because hopefully it can inspire more people to say, you know, if that ocean nowhere near me can be protected, maybe one that's near me can also be protected. I want to think about the the ways that we're connected in in ways that, that feel less scary. It's just an opportunity to understand. Part of that program that was really incredible is that it never really had a lot of opportunity to spend time with Australians before. The program was dreamt up by an Australian woman. There were a lot of Australians in the program. I live in Colorado. The weather that Colorado experiences has a, it's hugely affected by the Pacific Ocean and the atmos- interaction of the Pacific Ocean with the atmosphere and the storms that come in from there. And what was really cool about meeting Australians was to start to feel connected to the other side of that giant, giant, huge o- ocean, as well as the other side of the globe, and to realize that when it's dry here, it's usually really wet there. And when it's wet here, it's usually really dry there. And I knew that based on what I know about the science of the um, ocean atmosphere interaction. But it feels different when you can actually get online and you got to figure out your time zones, but you can get online and you can Skype someone in Australia and you can be like, oh my God, it's so dry in Colorado this winter. Is it dumping where you are? And have that conversation to, to feel that weather connection across the, the ocean. Like if I ever get really tired of a season, I can just travel. I'll never have to see that season again. If I if I really work at it, I never have to see summer again or winter again. Though, you know, it's it's good to have a balanced diet, so I wouldn't do that. But if you ever get like tired of a day, you know, it's like, oh, if I really wanted to, I'd never have to see this a day uh, again. But what are some of the what are some of the things that you're working on nowadays that are that have you excited? Like I, I mentioned, I think we mentioned previously that you're really into like advocating for science, like getting people excited about it. So are are there anything? I'd love to tell you, you and all the listeners um, about two different things. One is that one of the things that 
has been a successful part of the science I do for my career is that I study the consequences of early snowmelt. And right now we have the largest early snowmelt experiment that I have done to date, starting and running in the lowest snow year that Colorado's had since the 70s. And so snow would melt early this year because there was really low snowfall. And then we have an experiment set up in a mountain valley over by Crested Butte, where the Rocky Mountain Biology Lab is based. That's actually a field station. It's one of the most historic biological field stations in the U.S., and it's where I got my start doing mountain science there in 1992. The 21-year-old undergraduate decided that I did not want to study the insects on the bottom of ponds, which I was doing that summer, but I did want to study the mountains, um, and I've stuck with that. So it's kind of fun. My biggest experiment yet, it's funded by the U.S. Department of Energy, and there's a team of hydrologists, geologists, biologists, microbiologists, chemists that will all be doing a lot of sampling across these hill slopes as we try to understand the idea for doing a snowmelt manipulation is that it's like a little push on the ecosystem. You're you're kind of trying to give it a push, a big enough push, but not so big a push that you can understand the bounce that the ecosystem has. What capacity does the system have to keep doing what it does? Or does it change things in some dramatic way and focus a lot on the annual cycle because we're trying to understand water quality and water quantity in the Western U.S. from the projects that we're doing. And a lot of water is about what's available now, what's available in two months, what's available this year, not what's available in 10. And so we try to stay focused on that. So Chelsea Wimmer is field assistant and she she skis a lot, hikes a lot, has set up the experiment for this year with the help of a few other people. And I get near daily emails from her. It's melting enough. It's not melting enough. It's, melting <laughs> enough. it's not melting enough. Getting an experiment right, especially the kind of one that we're doing, isn't easy. And we just keep coming back to, we don't have to do it perfect. Science doesn't have to be done perfectly in order to gain an incredible amount of insight. And sometimes simple mistakes can be how you learn the most. So we're, we're accepting that we might make some mistakes as we do this. So that's one of the things that I'm really excited about. And then why do a lot of science and just write about it in a science journal that a bunch of scientists read. That's kind of been a sticking point for me ever since I began my PhD that I felt like I wanted to tell people about the projects that I do and the places that I go and what we learn and not just in formal ways, in informal ways like this podcast. So I've been doing that. It's not what you get a lot of credit for within the field of science. You get, you become more prestigious by publishing more in scientific journals and by getting more funding and sort of the sharing science, the outreach part, we could be valuing it more. I am incredibly appreciative that the the scientific society that I'm, I most associate with, it's called the American Geophysical Union. That sounds really complex. It's just a bunch of us study the earth in space. We try to figure out how places near us and places really far away from us, really simple places and really complex places. We, you know, somebody studies them all trying to figure out how they work. And the AGU has invested this year in a new program called Voices for Science, um, selected to be one of the inaugural cohort. I met 29 other colleagues who are part of that program, and their investment is to help us do the work that we do to share science and then to create more buzz to hopefully encourage more people within the sciences to want to share science and and hopefully create some more excitement and enthusiasm from people who who might otherwise not be receptive to scientific information to be like, oh, I didn't know that's what you did, because sometimes it is that we're just not sharing it enough. So yeah, Voices for Science. It's a really cool new opportunity. I love the name of it. Maybe we'll end up on what, what, The Voice, right? Isn't that one of the the music shows with some judges? We can have scientists being the voice for science and have judges and evaluations and... <laughs> That would be fun. It would be really different. I can't even imagine it right now. Just as I say it, I'm like, oh my God, that would be weird. <laughs> I'd watch. It'd be like a Star Talk, the the show with Neil deGrasse Tyson. It's, it's, I always think it's fun to learn what people were doing at like at certain points of my life. You know, like, oh, when I was 10, someone was doing something. When I was born, you were deciding to, le- to work on mountains. So that's kind of funny, which is weird. I don't know. It's like when you were like having these existential concerns about what you wanted to do with your life, I was, I, I was born. For people who want to be involved in these types of researches with, you know, large snowmelt, for instance, or other projects that are going on, how do they do that? Like, do you, 
if let's say they don't have a PhD or maybe they do, I mean, maybe the advice differs based on your, your credential, but is there a way to get involved and be a part of this research and, and push science forward? I love the question, Lol. I've been thinking a lot about that because getting back to where we started in this whole podcast, I said, I can tell my students think about things differently than how I do. I want to have those conversations with them and be open to what they share. So you don't need to be an expert in science to be able to look at and see something and think, huh, that's interesting, isn't it? It might be something different than what I would point out or pick out. And that's where the value is in seeing different things within a mountain hill slope and wanting to ask questions about them. So ways to get involved. Um, One, I think you're setting me up that I need to do another Reddit, ask me anything. (laughs) And this one needs to be, we just melted snow early. What should we measure? (laughs) (laughs) One of the main things we focus on, um, Chelsea and I focus on, is the timing of when plants grow and flower. Want to know if they manage to do everything that they need to do in a growing season, get bigger, store carbon, store sugars, produce a flower, get pollinated, produce a seed. We try to figure out whether those things are happening. And and the, the reproduction, the flower and the bee are pretty interesting to us. But we focus more on the leaves because we're the, the plants in the landscape we, we work in are the, are the way that water moves up to the atmosphere. Or if it doesn't move up to the atmosphere through the, through the plants, then it moves down to the rivers. And ultimately, we're trying to understand how much water is there. So we can't measure anything, but it sure would be fun to get a sense for what people would want us to measure. And then this is the first year that I'm doing this, and, and we don't have it ready yet, but we're hoping to have it ready sometime in June. I coordinated with an illustrator, and we want to create real-time animations of the data as we collect it and see whether that is a way to do exactly what you're describing, which is to to create interest in the research as it's being done, have some online discussions, hear from people like, oh my God, really lupin's flowering now? Who would have thought lupin would be flowering now? Lupin is a really abundant plant in and around Crested Butte. The hill slopes turn such a bright, crazy shade of purple that you can't really tell where there's shale, a kind of rock that has a purple tint to it, and where there's fields full of lupin. The lupin can be so dense, it almost looks like a rocky cliff. So we've got some ideas. She's Chelsea's going to try and get set up. She's set up on Instagram. She's got, I don't know, maybe you can attach this to the podcast in some way that you can click on it. Um, but she's the one to follow more than me, because she's the one who's literally going up and down the mountain hill slopes every day, five days a week, She does take weekends off to figure out what plants are growing and when they're growing and what the patterns are across elevation. And I think if we can find more ways for people to get get excited about that, then they might be able to connect. Oh, and it's not just because it's when I want to see the flowers and take pictures. It also matters for my water. That's what I'd like people to start to be able to connect is when plants grow affects water too, not just scenery. One of my flowers just grew like four inches in like a day and it's happened right after I fed it. So it's like, I fed you good then. But <laughs> have, you, have you ever used a time lapse camera right after you do this? So need to, well, it'd be an investment, but it's like $150. You get a time lapse camera. You set it right up next to your, your plant and you take pictures um, every 20 seconds or every minute during that day. And if your plants are really growing as much it is, as it is, you'll get to see that growth. And it's really wild to watch the time lapse, you know, the four minute version um, of the plant growing. But the other thing that you get to watch, one of my students did this um, with dandelions, you get to watch the plants dance Mm -hmm. um, in ways that that their movements are so slow that over a whole day, they appear to have not moved at all. Mm -hmm. And yet they're moving, like their leaves are moving. And this isn't even in the wind. This was in the greenhouse. It could happen in your house. The stem and the flowers will be repositioning themselves in relation to environmental variables that are going on around around your kitchen or wherever you have your plant. And yeah, it's actually really fun to watch plant stands. Well, I have a DSLR, so maybe I can try to find some type of setting on it or hook it up to the internet and get some type of mod so I can a thing, because that would be fun. I mean, you can see it. Like, it changes throughout the day. Like, I, I, I watch it and I have a pretty good idea on measurements when I look at things. And I mean, I, I couldn't tell you like from a mile away, like how, you know, how many inches apart something is, but from like close to it, like this thing grew an inch and I can tell. So, so yeah, I'm going to, I'll look into that. It might be fun. The, it's always, it's always interesting to find new ways of experiencing the world around you. I like to have like a notepad with me and I write down things that I don't know. And then I will go home and like research it and like kind of make like a little uh, journal thing about it. Cause like, then I'll learn, like I'll know it the next time, which is probably why I have a lot of really esoteric knowledge. 
But is there anything like that that you do where you're just like, you write down questions you have and then answer them and, and do that type of thing? Yeah, I write down a lot of notes. <laughs> I have giant stacks of notes. I have them around my office where I'm sitting right now. I have them in buckets in my garage because I don't know. I think we all have different ways that we approach things. And I just, I'm constantly, so at some point I used to think inside the box. I was a very inside the box thinker back in high school. And maybe I wasn't, but I was trying to be because it felt like other people were happier when I was inside the box and I could do the things that people asked. So, you know, people ask why science? Because people were really impressed in the eighties when a girl could get straight A's in chemistry and physics. And so I was like, oh, well, I'll keep doing more of that. And I got A's in biology too, but people were more impressed by the A's in chemistry and physics. And um, I went to some regional physics engineering challenges. I grew up in Massachusetts and I ended up winning a a uh, Hewlett Packard, Packard calculator from one of them because I scored so high on one of these tests. But it isn't really something that people rewarded me for early, but I'm so much happier being present in a space that's outside of the box. And so now I have all these giant piles of notes that I've allowed myself to accumulate over 25 years of doing science. And my phone is full of notes now. Oh my gosh, phones have like all kinds of ways you can voice memo and record notes. And I don't always go back to every single one of them. That's why they accumulate. Some of them I'd like to think could be a book, an autobiography at some point, a little bit like the Lab Girl book that Hope Jaren wrote. That's just an absolute fun read for anybody in or outside of science to kind of be present in that space of what a scientist thinks about. What are the ones that I go back to the most often? The ones that of all those different ideas, the ones that I want to go back to the most are the ones that inspire hope. At different times, as part of being a scientist, it feels like I'm collecting information on what's not working. And not because I intentionally want to keep information on what's not working. It's just that's where we're at with some of the, the things that are happening on the planet. Just as much we're recording data and we're learning and and my notes on all kinds of different papers are about the the seeds for what we could do different and the incredible resilience of of people and species and the earth. And I think it's really important that we keep putting out those stories too, even if they seem like they contradict some of the reasons for concern, it shouldn't be interpreted that we're contradicting and saying, oh, get worried. No, don't get worried. It's not that. It's just recognizing that it's more complex, that if we can understand those those parts of the systems that no matter what we throw at it still seem to work, where and how can that help us identify the opportunity for paths to solutions to make sure that people have the amount of water they need to plan for the activities they do, that we have the energy resources we need, and that we have the the views and the vistas, both, you know, what's on the land and that the air is clear enough that we can see across um, to see it. <laughs> I understand why in the news they always emphasize the negative, but I, I like to see, I like to see it all, you know, like I like, I like to have a good picture of how everything is, because I don't know, like, I don't even really watch the news anymore because it's always, especially in America, like, there's always something really sad going on. But what, where do you, where do you go to get that type of hopeful information as well to get, like, a more complete picture? Is there a place, I mean, I think you're going to say journals, but, like, is there any place outside of a, a, a science journal? Several of the, the studies that I've done have shown where and how plants respond in positive ways having a longer growing season, for example, when there's more CO2 in the atmosphere and there's warmer temperatures. That doesn't mean that everything's going to be good in, in under those environmental conditions, but, but plants do some surprising things. And people have asked me if science journals will publish that information. I'm like, that's easy. Like They'll publish anything that's a good, well-designed study with conclusions that are consistent with the data that's presented. Um, the harder piece, as you're mentioning, is, is where and how we can tell these stories more to more different audiences. One of the places, and, and I'm going to smile as I say this, that I, I find some of the most hope is on Twitter. I've become a pretty big fan of, of science Twitter over the past um, year and a half. And the community of people, of scientists, who've decided to share themselves, share their stories, share pieces of them, their families, 
but also their passion, their concern for the people who are within the science community, growing the culture so that it's more diverse and inclusive, bits of wisdom from the places they go. There's an opportunity to reach broader public through your your podcast and say, um, get on Twitter and follow a couple scientists. They're really going to tell you some good and funny and entertaining and uplifting stories because we have control over that space. Like I can post anything I want on Twitter, post what I post with the ethics guided by what I know about how nature works. So I'm not going to post something that's not accurate, but we have more flexibility and more opportunity to share stories in a different way there than we can through through a news article or, or a science journal article or even a presentation. I'm still trying to figure out how to get public presentations right because so much more of the way I think science needs to be shared, a dialogue rather than a lecture or presentation. And we, we really haven't created those spaces for dialogue about science as much as we could. Yeah, Twitter is one of the ones that I keep hearing about. So I keep getting on there and trying to connect with people, which it's... I don't know, it's not something I would think about. It's like, oh, I wouldn't think Twitter. Are there any scientists that, I'll have to add you on Twitter if I haven't, but are there any scientists that you follow that are kind of fun in like the climate or mountain space? So one is Dane Zelikova, and uh, she made the film The End of Snow with Morgan Heim. So Jane is a scientist and Morgan is the filmmaker. And and Jane posts some pretty funny things and, and great stories and, and a lot on, on inclusion and diversity. There's a I want to say that it's Rose df and i it's something like that but if you searched for rose she's an astrophysicist i want to say i love her posts and i love that i know nothing about astrophysics and yet it's a way to learn about a field and um on what it's like to be in science uh, as a as somebody who's whose race is less well represented in the science community so that's some of what you get to see on science twitter too yeah, definitely. And if, if since you said you have a Twitter, I'll try and find you and add you to the show notes as well, so people can can uh, tweet you. Yeah. So I'm I'm at Heidi Mountains, and that makes sense. That I figured my last name isn't that familiar to people, <laughs> and and the connection. It is. I hope you're smiling right now, Lowell, because my name is Heidi. It's been Heidi since I was born. My full name is actually my full first name is actually Heidi Marie, um, and it's a a German name that people often associate with the mountains because of that storybook that was w- written in Switzerland. And so I think it is kind of funny that I I was named Heidi. My parents had no vision that I would be a mountain scientist. I actually thought I wanted to be an oceanographer and Heidi Oceans might not have have, have had the same um, <laughs> um, catchiness to it. Heidi Mountain seems to work. Yeah, I mean, if I, it would be funny if like our names indicated what we would... Like, do you have any recommended books that you tend to recommend to people? Even, even the books you recommend to your students because I'm a big textbook reader. Like not a not a textbook reader, but a person who reads textbooks. So like uh, anything is always great. I don't read textbooks and I don't any longer require textbooks in any of my classes. There are a bunch of different reasons for that, including that college is expensive. Kids mm-hmm. are broke by using more open source media and resources. They can save some money and it makes college a little bit more affordable. I also think um, textbooks can be pretty I like them for encyclopedias, like as a resource when you have a question, but not to just read a whole chapter. So we differ on that one, Lol. I don't tend to read textbooks very much. No, I do the same thing as for you. I use them as primers. And then I jump Uh, off on, uh, I go to the back of the book and find the sources that they referred to and then jump off to them. I do a lot of reading these days about, I want to say four years ago now, two girlfriends and I went on a backpacking trip way before all the snow was gone, we went up to a place called Navajo Lake in the Western San Juan Mountains, just had a total blast. And we came back to Durango. There's only a couple nights up there, but it was just created some bonds. And and we were like, how are we going to stay connected and have a space that think big thoughts and we talk big ideas and get inspired by what's going on in our world. And so we created this book club and my um, it's continued to grow. I don't know if there's 20 of us in the book club now, a bunch of amazing outdoorsy women in Durango. I love having them pick books for me. Mm-hmm. So I did actually pick the book. The book this month I picked, it's called River of Lost Souls. And it's by an author called Jonathan Thompson. And it just came out. And it's about the river that runs through our community and the history of the human history and the the natural history of the watershed. So I did something very standard. I'm the scientist and I suggested a science book for our book club. Mm-hmm. But more of the books are about people and people in diverse cultures, people facing challenges, people finding space in which to heal. The books that we read, we just did Angel of Repose by Walter uh, Wallace Stegner. One of our favorite authors is a woman who wrote the book, um, The Marriage of Opposites. And um, she also wrote the book, The Dove Keepers. And I'm forgetting her name right now. A lot of them are stories of women 
Oh, excellent. I always like to find more. And I like a lot of books that have been recommended to me that have women in his, in a historical sense. Like I, I like, I'm a big history biography or like, like in science topics as well, it really interesting. There hasn't been a lot of female version of Einstein or like a woman that has done things that are as interesting as what Einstein has done, for instance. So I always like to find more like that. So it's good that you recommended a couple and that, or like, do you have any recommendations like with that in mind? Cause like, Oh yeah. With that in mind, the book I just finished is called lab girl mm-hmm. and I've been wanting to read it for years. It's by a woman named um, Hope Jaren and all so far each sci- female scientist that I've talked to feels like she, her autobiography resonates with us in some way because it's like, Oh my God, I remember having that same experience. I remember the joy, the frustration of these parts of, of being a scientist. And so her book is, is, is absolutely fun and fantastic. And I'm looking forward to, I got invited to, to read it, given a free copy and then be part of a discussion in a rural library in um, the southwest part of Colorado, where I live. So um, next week, I actually go to Ignacio, to the public library in Ignacio. I have no idea who will be there, but my job is to help the book come alive so that mm-hmm. somebody who reads it, who who doesn't feel like it speaks to them, that it's the story of their life, can learn a little bit more because I'll be like, oh my gosh, I absolutely remember spending hours collecting samples and then having to throw them all away and finding out there was there's one part of her, her autobiography where she goes to Ireland with her, her colleague, Bill. They didn't have a permit and they have to throw all the samples in the garbage at customs. <laughs> so wow. I've, I've done something similar. <laughs> That's got to suck. Is there any, any like hopeful, fun notes we can leave on before we call it a quits for the episode? Scientists care. Scientists care about people and planet. That's the hopeful note. I'm sure you've gotten that sense from the podcasts you've been doing, if you've been doing them with a bunch of other people in the science community. How is it that, that you can find and, and create a forum? I'm appreciative of this forum that you're creating as a space to to share that message and to know that I'm one of many voices. That's the other thing that's really important to me is is there are many scientists who want to do and, and create more opportunities for engagement. We want our voices to be heard. We want the, the voices of other scientists to be heard. So thank you for this this opportunity. And, and hopefully I've shared a couple morsels of something that's interesting to the world out there and, and inspire a couple people to, to value science and see science in a new way. And that was Heidi Steltzer, environmental science explorer and communicator. Got into quite a lot of topics today, and hope such as how she finds herself in nature, stories about lichen and how they last for a very long time, and yet they're very susceptible to climate change. Very sad way, how everyone can get more active and engaged, and the things she thinks about and wants to work on in the future. That was a, a little bit of what we got into, and I hope each and every one of you enjoyed it. Please let me know. Thank you for joining us today with Learning with Lowell. I am your host, Lowell Thompson. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a review. We can be found on Twitter at Lowell was here, Facebook, and on the website, learningwithlowell.com. Also sign up for the newsletter where you can hear amazing content every Monday, new episodes every Tuesday, and new blog posts around every Thursday. Remember to share and tell your friends. Please and thank you. (laughs) 